<laughs> All right, thank you for joining me today, Tony. If you don't mind, will you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Tony Kristen Walker. I am the Director of Prevention and Community Partnerships for AIDS Alabama. I um, am also one of the co-founders of Birmingham, Birmingham Black Friday. I also produce uh, two podcasts, Same Crap, Different Day, and let me say this, which has focuses on um, current events, and we really talk a lot about race, uh, gender, sexual health. Um, I'm also a father, grandfather, uncle, uh, mentor, <laughs> Uh, and big brother to a lot of people in the community. That's amazing. So um, what are some of the projects that you're working on, you know, personal projects? I mean, because I know your work is very personal, you know, during the pandemic, how are y'all operating? So um, back in March, I think around March 16th, AIDS Alabama made the decision to, um, to really, really social distance to protect ourselves and our clients. We never shut down any of our services. We just kind of scale back and let people work from home when they could. When we had to interface with clients, we made sure that we were protecting ourselves and them. Um, I actually have a drop-in center called The Hub that's located on 6th Avenue South across from Iron City and next to Nelson Glass. And we started doing voluntary uh, temperature checks when people came in. And we also were able to provide masks for people, both uh, some of our clients and employees from the Birmingham Mask Group, which is an awesome group, uh, especially right now. Those people are doing some amazing work. Um, so right now, uh, you know, we're still doing testing, linkages to care. I started a PrEP clinic, which is a, a pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. It's a once-a-day pill that people take to prevent HIV. Uh, so we're still doing all of the things that we were doing before. Uh, we just kind of scaled back, mainly because of demand. With the uh, with the epidemic, there were a lot of um, people afraid to go out. So we couldn't really, um, I mean, we didn't have the demand, but we were there. We tried to let people know that we were there. Uh, other things I'm working on, I'm currently working with the uh, State Health Department to see about us doing COVID-19 testing, whether um, antigen or antibody testing, uh, to make sure that people know whether or not they've had it or if they had it, how we can get into care. This is something we're just starting on, uh, just because my thing is protecting the community. And when I say the community, I mean the entire community, but especially marginalized population. Well, I, I wanna thank you for all the work that you're doing in Birmingham and that you have done and you continue to do. Um, I know that, appreciate, that the community appreciates you and uh, Thank you for being a part of this project. Um, Thank you. So uh, we're going to kind of move into the, the big section of this is the, the personal section. So I want to ask you and, and kind of jumping off on that, like what does community mean to you? And what are some of the things that you love about the Birmingham community in particular? Uh, for me, community is like anything that you touch or touches you. Um, you know, a lot of times we want to define things in terms of relationships, but I think a lot of times people don't understand what a relationship is. A lot of people think that, you know, I have to have a personal close contact and even conversation with you in order to have a relationship. But even if there's a person who lives on your block who you never talk to, but you speak to them every day when you're walking down the street, you have a relationship with that person. So, like, even if you walk by one day, you don't speak. They don't even know you, but it kind of makes them feel kind of weird. Like, why didn't he speak to me today? Because you developed that relationship. So for me, relationships are very important. Uh, and I think uh, some some relationships need to be defined, whereas others, you know, don't have to be defined. Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with uh, Birmingham. Uh, I think we could be so much better than, than what we are. So that frustrates me sometimes. Um, and I'm very vocal about it, you know, and I think sometimes I'm misunderstood by people because I tend to be like a big picture thinker. Uh, details, I kind of get lost in details sometimes. So like, I'm really looking at the big picture of a lot of things when I when I make comments or when I speak. Um, but, you know, we Birmingham is a, is a decent, decent city, um, but I just feel like, you know, that we could be so much better than where we are. I agree. Uh, there's always room for, for progress, you know, and I think right. that, uh, you know, the, 
your friends and your loved ones and the people who respect you really appreciate you for your honesty and uh, for okay. just telling it how it is. You know? <laughs> it's okay, it's okay until, it, until it turns on them and then it's like, oh my God, Tony just said something that I didn't like. And I'm like, well, you asked. I mean, I get that too. And sometimes I wonder if it's like growing up not white, you know, like growing up in a, in a family of color that like my mom was always very blunt, you know, and was always telling it how it is, but she wasn't wrong. So right. I, I, feel, I feel like it's a good quality. You know, <laughs> I, I used to be a member of this church and they had this motto and it was called uh, truthing in love. Like true thing in love like I'm always honest with people and even though they don't sometimes understand it it always comes from a place of love like I'm not a person to go out and intentionally hurt someone uh, I think that's just rude crude and unattractive yeah but I think there are sometimes people need to hear hard truths and you don't have to be nasty with it when you say it uh, depending on the circumstances but you know you have to be honest with people about the way that you feel and hopefully even if you don't agree with someone, you can agree to disagree. Exactly. Well, it, you know, it, it always, it should always come from a place of love. Always. You know, always from a place of love and care, you know, and it, it, sometimes it's because you care and feel so much, you know, that you, you just have to tell it how it is. So what, what does pride mean to you? And I know that that can be a, a very loaded, <laughs> loaded question, but bear with me. <laughs> Okay, so for me, um, in order to understand what pride means to me, you have to know who I am. So I'm a 53-year-old man, uh, born in the late 60s, you know, raised in the 70s and 80s. I was born in a very poor black community to the west of here called Dolomite. And I was bused into an upper middle class white city called Pleasant Grove. Um, the presence of racism was always there. So even when I look at the LGBTQ movement, even though, you know, Stonewall was started by trans women of color, uh, you know, it's always been very white leaning. So I really didn't really identify with that because I didn't see me in that. Um, fast forward to when I met my husband in 2008, my first um, <clears throat> gay pride was in 2009. And I understood the movement, I understood why the visibility was necessary, but I've been like out and open about my sexuality since I was about 21. And I've never felt the need to like lead with that. You know, I lead with the fact that I'm a person first. I'm a person who happens to be male, who happens to be black, who happens to be gay. And and for me, leading with anything other than my humanity kind of like compromises that. So, you know, I understand, um, like there are a lot of movements, the gay movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, I, I understand the need for all those, but I'm a person first and I always lead with my personhood instead of my identity. And that pisses some people off sometimes, but you know, that's just me and how I identify. So to answer your question, um, up until recently, pride has not meant a lot to me because I never saw myself in it. Um, even um, with us creating identify with this stuff, you know, we support you, you know, do what you need to do, but it doesn't represent who I am or what's important to me, um, which is why, you know, we created Birmingham Black Pride. You know, I love the fact that June is Pride Month, and I love the fact that so many of my marginalized sisters and brothers, regardless of race or ethnicity, you know, can find a, a place to be themselves. Uh, but for me, I've never really identified wholly with, you know, pride as a, as a, as a thing. So could you tell me a little bit about Black Pride and, um how it was started in Birmingham and what kind of events y'all are doing this month and, and for the future? Sure, so Birmingham Black Pride actually is in August. Uh, we purposely moved in in August to um, be closer to the, the death date of um, Bayard Rustin, who was a black, act, black gay activist in the 60s who worked closely with Dr. King. We wanted to have it on his birthday, but it was in March and it was just a little too cold. Um, we were formed three years ago, and the main reason we formed kind of goes back to the reason for my, um, my, my disassociation with Pride, because even in the stuff that we do in Birmingham during June, 
I never saw myself. Uh, we had actually uh, tried to do events in conjunction, and those just never seemed to work out. So instead of complaining about it, we just decided to create our own event. Um, our first year, we had Anthony Williams, who was uh, a contestant on um, um, that the the clothing show. I can't think of the name of it right now. Oh, Project um, Runway. Project Runway, yes. yeah. And ironically, <laughs> Anthony, Anthony used to work for me when I uh, managed the Gap <laughs> back in the 90s when he was in high school. Um, and then uh, last year, we had Dominique Jackson compose. And this year, we actually have um, Isis King from America's Next Top Model. Um, but we're, we're going to have to make, move the events to virtual, I think. I don't, I don't know. Hopefully, coronavirus will die, but I doubt it. Um, but, yeah, so, like, our events are really focused on the Black LGBTQ experience. In the past three years, well, last two years, I was focusing on uh, highlighting the trans experience, which is why I had Isis and uh, Dominique, uh, which, you know, you know, when you think about levels of marginalization, you know, trans women, you know, they get the brand of just about everything. So I kind of wanted to lift them up in that, but also just speak to the issues that aren't really talked about um, broadly during the Pride Month that we, 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 we've always had. So like in the black community, HIV is a huge issue. I'm HIV positive. I've been living with HIV positive, HIV for a number of years. Uh, so like being able to have a forum to discuss that, uh, discuss things like PrEP, uh, and just how are you doing as a black person in the South? You know, um, so like we don't do any parades or marches, um, but we have a banquet in which we honor people who have been doing work in the community over the years. Uh, we have an educational summit. Last year, we added a comedy show and a spoken word uh, event, uh, along with our pride parties on Saturday, which we have a day party and an evening party, and then like a a big picnic on Sunday. This year, we are trying. We are still trying to because it's a moving target. Like we don't know what this year is going to look like. Yeah. Um, but we are we are determined to do something. This month, though, we are going to do two concerts, two virtual concerts, one featuring Dominique Posey, who's from Birmingham, who was uh, on American Idol, and um, a drag show. So we're going to do three events, two concerts, and a drag show uh, during the month of June, virtually. That's amazing. Please keep me posted on that. Um, I, I remember now that uh, Dominique from Pose was at at Black Pride last year, and I was very sad I couldn't yeah. go because I was actually in New York for a family wedding, <laughs> and so I was trying to get my friends to go, and I was like, "Please go and take a photo with her." Um, all right, so she was, she was awesome. She was awesome. She's amazing. Like her, her character on Pose is like everything. Yeah. Like just everything. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Reading is fundamental. Do you agree? And what do you think about that statement? And tying into it, how do you think libraries can be of assistance uh, to the, the Black uh, queer community and continue to be? Reading, reading is fundamental. I think that that, coin, that was coined back in the 70s or late 60s. I remember Riff as a young child. Um, I, I read when I can, uh, but I think that the, the importance of reading to our community, again, is having books in which we show up. My my son goes to Red Mountain Community School, which is a couple blocks over from the library. I'm pretty sure they're in here a lot. But, um, you know, they did this thing where they decolonized their bookshelves. So, like, instead of having these stories of the uh, agrarian south in which you know everything was lovely and there were southern yeah. bells and southern gentlemen like just tell the truth black people were enslaved you know it was not a cute scene um but then but then also you know making sure that books are available for people to identify with like books like elian harris you know you got people like audra lord you know you know black icons you know in the in the movement and just in our history who have gone you know unheard of you know one of the things that, that um, a queer history month, and 
what people miss in that is that there are so many queer black people who were left out of history or we just don't really know who they were for real. People like, you know, Bessie Smith, even Bayard Rustin, like Bayard Rustin was so instrumental in the civil rights movement, but I was like 40 something when I heard about him. You know, so it was like, there's a, like a culture erasure that, that takes place. So making sure that people have books that they can relate to, uh, that reflect them, that they can see themselves in is very important important if you're going to talk about reading for people because no one wants to read anything that they can identify with. I actually, um, during the coronavirus, uh, wrote my first book. Uh, I'm in the editing stages now. Um, it's going to be a part of a trilogy of books that I'm writing, which are loosely based on, very not very loosely, but based on my life. <laughs> in my experience as a young black boy, in the 80s who's gay who has a child it's, it's it's a big mess but yeah i think that's very important <laughs> that is amazing and i will buy a copy <laughs> um i'm so glad you're writing a book um <laughs> that's a great uh segue into my next question which is uh, are there any books uh, or authors or films that have been highly influential to your life um, oh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the first one I think about when I think about books is The Invisible Life by Elaine Harris. Uh, and it was so resonant for me because, you know, being gay and being able to pass in quote unquote the normal world is a privilege that so many people don't get. And, um, and, and, and you know, cisgender, straight identifying queer people need to realize that we have a gift and that we should use it um, kind of like I want white people to use white privilege. You know, I don't want you to give it up, but I want you to use it for good. So being able to, to defend and take care of people who are less fortunate than you is very important. So like, yeah, The Invisible Life was, was really, really important for me. Um, when I think about films recently, Moonlight. Um, Great film. Moonlight. Yeah, it was it was it was touching on so many uh, things that I identify with. Uh, I'm almost about to tear up now. I'm a crier, <laughs> <laughs> but that was uh, very very uh, very near and dear to my heart, and it really spoke to me. Uh, and and there are other um, movies um, that have that have done that as well. Uh, the Color Purple is one of my favorite movies and books. I could read it all day. And even uh, when it comes to um, not even books that are not based on black people for real or black queer people, but The Handmaid's Tale and then the follow-up, The Testament, oh my God, it has <laughs> such implications to where we are now as a nation. Yes. You know, it is like the author said that when she wrote it in 1985, she was like, you know, this will never happen. And then last year, she's like, oh, crap, we're here. <laughs> okay, so the last two questions are the real um, heart jerkers uh, pulling the strings. But um, if you could give your younger self advice, what would it be? Um, mm, um, if I could give my younger self advice, it would be that you're enough. And and you're you're fine just the way you are, and that that actually plays into things that I struggle with, even with being a part of this project and being highlighted. Uh, I wouldn't call it triggering because triggering has a negative connotation, but you know I was I was I'm, I am short. I'm still short. Uh, I wasn't that cute as a kid, um, and I was smarter than the average bear. <laughs> And when you're in a poor community, education isn't really valued. Or I got criticized for in my community. So in 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 the way that plays into this, I don't like my name being highlighted for real, because when that happened when I was a kid, I was punished for it by my by my by my peers. You know, oh that's Tony Walker. He thinks he's smarter than everybody else. You know, he thinks he's this, he thinks he's that. So I kind of shy away from being in the spotlight, although I do a whole lot of stuff, uh, even with my Facebook presence. 
but it's not like I'm doing it because I want to be seen. I'm doing it because I, there's some things I need to say. So, um, so yeah, I, I would tell myself that you're enough and that you're going to do great things because I had no idea that, you know, this would be my life. Yeah. Um, and, and tying into that, um, in what ways would your younger self be proud of who you are today? <laughs> I, don't think I, really I love that question. It's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that, oh my God. <laughs> um, okay, so another thing about me, an another thing about me, I am the intentional and sometimes unintentional mentor of a lot of kids. Um, I raised two boys, and I kind of raised my, my first cousin, who's the same age as my son. Um, and I realized that my adult life, I have been taking care of young boys in particular and some girls who didn't have a father figure. So my grandparents raised me. And if I had met myself when I was a kid, I would have taken care of me. So, so my, oh my God, <laughs> my um, my younger self would 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 love me because I took care of of them. Um, you know, my husband and I adopted my my nephew who was in foster care in Georgia. Um, we became his guardians, and then we actually full on adopted him. Uh, I have a my husband's first cousin was kind of like our first child together. Uh, and we we have taken care and nurtured them. Um, you know, my grandchildren and a parent to mentor a young guy. Um, and he actually ended up moving here, graduated from our college. Uh, there's another young man who we went to church with who we have just nurtured. And my younger self will be proud of me for taking care of him. Well, is there any, <laughs> oh, I'm so happy that you have agreed to be a part of this project and I thank you for your time and, um, and just thank you for being in the community and, uh, I'm so glad that, uh, we have met in this way. Um, is there anything else that you would like, uh, to share, like anything you would like to say for anybody who's listening? Um, yeah, actually two things. One, uh, to kids like me, you know, seek out people who will support you. You know, find find me. If you're a young, gay, queer, um, black kids in particular, kids in general, find me, seek me out. Uh, I, 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 I am there for you. Uh, it's just what, I, what I've done. Uh, for parents, uh, if you are the parent of a of a queer kid, um, black in particular, you know, just a parent in general, you know, if you need some help or instruction on how to deal with your child, how to support them, how to love them, reach out to me. I'm available. Uh, you know, I hope you have my contact information on here. I mean, down to my personal cell phone number, I don't care. Uh, but so many people struggle with their religion and the identity of their kids and so many kids are hurt because they feel like their parents don't love them and i think that sometimes it's not that they don't love them they just don't understand how to love them yeah um so yeah so i i mean i'm i'm open to be a resource uh, i've been doing this for 30 years uh and i'm and i'll never get tired of it well i thank you for your time and uh thank you thank you again you're welcome. Thank you.